620621B, The Path of Life, Los Angeles, California, USC. Thank you, Brother Borders. You know, it's such a fine privilege of being among the people and then being my first time in a Jewish synagogue. It's quite a rare treat for me. And then understanding more of this, the order here of these scrolls and how they are taken care of and so forth, it'd be a good time to come in sometime and have a healing service in the synagogue and have the Jews, a brother says, come. You're welcome, Brother Branham, come. Thank you, brother, thank you very much. I've always had a feeling for the Jewish people. Perhaps there's none here but this morning, but I have a feeling for them, always have. And I believe that someday the Gentile church will take the message to the Jew as a Jew gave it to the Gentile. I believe that with all my heart. And then when that goes back to the Jew in full, you watch the Gentile door will close then. And it will be the Jew. So now is the time. I'm so glad to be in right now on the inside. God bless this gracious little man, Brother Michelson. I've never seen him in my life. I wouldn't know him if he was standing here. He might be in the audience, and I would not know it. But I've heard his program and I appreciate it. A good servant of God, that poor little Jew that has given his life now in service for God. I and for, I like the way he says that, my Jesus, yeah? My Jesus. I think that was uh, so striking for the Jew to say that. He certainly has been a torchbearer, a torch holder for the Jewish people in his country around across America here, and my sincere prayer is God give them feeble old arms strength to hold it up until Jesus comes if possible. I admire him, I admire old men when they fought the good fights. Remember Dr. F. F. Bosworth, one of my associates, when I went in to see him, he was 84 years old, had his little old arms out like that, and they back there, they just come off the fields of Africa, at 80 years old, missionary with me in the jungle, and I ran to him and threw my arms around him, and I knew he was dying, and I cried out, my father, my father, the child of Israel and the horsemen there of such a gallant man. And he said, this is the happiest time of my life, Brother Branham. He said, I said, you know you're dying. He said, I can't die. I've already been dead for 60 years. He said, I'm just waiting the moment when I see all that I have lived for, see him walk in that door to invite me to his house. And said, that's the way. I think of then, lives of all great men all remind us. We can make our lives a blime with partings leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. It's true. But the cop speaks by the Branham, yes. He continues speaking. I might not have heard just, I heard that he shook hands with standing in the room. Shake. He continues speaking. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 sir. That I heard that. That's all right, by the cop. I'm glad that you reminded me of, yes. They said quite a while before he died or went home, he raised up and shaken hands with converts of his that come to Christ through his ministry for a long time and then gave up the spirit and went on to be with them. Such a gallant. I just love such things as that. That's just, brethren, it's such a privilege to be here in Los Angeles or this South Gate, wherever it may be called here, why are we having the fellowship, the meeting with this fine fellowship? It's uh, been meeting me in here, and I would not have come if I hadn't have been some kind of a pulling to come. And I realize that my ministry has become a place where it's almost to a showdown. I like how things come to that. I, they have begun to speak things the world has, and associations, and so forth. That I'm a false prophet, and everything. And I look for that to come. It's a wonder. It hadn't come before now and but I'm looking for it to even get worse and to find that in this hour of my trials and deep distress going through that you brethren threw open your arms and I appreciate you the Lord bless you and I'm here to do everything that I know how to do to help your churches to be stronger to unite the brotherhood together in one heart and that's the purpose that I have and to as I said last night to sin every little corner and cut every little minnow that can be caught for the kingdom of God. And now last night I was late. And we got started late and I'm nearly always late. My mother said I was a full nine months baby and I was kind of getting late here. And I was born only weighing five pounds and had a bad start. I never did get very big. And I'm just, I was late for my wedding. I kept my wife waiting a long time. 
and it's always wait and lit now if i can just bleed for my funeral that's all that's all just let them wait as long as they can because i want to be just as long as i can preach a gospel and fellowship with my brethren and now we i'll try to be just a little quicker tonight last night now is just ministers here as i understand i'm trying to set a bit now the sin are setting out of their sea and the first thing you might have wondered why I didn't make an altar call. First thing, I felt that I was just a little late and that tires the people and so forth. But just a little bit uh, bait under the discernment or something that will get there, get them attracted. And then spread your tent around, you see, and then bring them in. Just bear with me now. I'm going just the way I think the Spirit leads me to go. And now, if we do get some into the net that wants to be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, brethren, you know what district they're out of. Get them to a church, because that, just pull them to the altar is about as far as you can get them there. And then you take them the rest of the way from there. Take them in and baptize them and stay with them till they receive the Holy Ghost. And that's what we're here for in this great dark hour as the sun is setting in the west and the evening light is out. And I, among the people, if you, many of you, it's no secret. You all have my tips, all of you. And But among the people out there, I just an approach on scriptural strong doctrines. I would like, I was in Tabernacle or something, and on the tips where ministers could take it and study. And I come up this morning with a Greek form, the old country, and it's got my six-hour tip on the seed word. And he tells me that he just go just a little bit each day and take those and break it down and bring it into the Greek and how he was showing how me not knowing nothing about it, how it just sets together like that. That's for study in here. We're trying to fish. This is it. We're putting the bait out there and we never show the fish the hook. <laughs> you show him the bait. He grabs the bait and gets the hook. So that's most of my time in praying for the sick and things is just to catch the sinner's eye. That's a bait. But the hook, the gospel hook, you use that. It'll just shake the bait before him. You see, so you use the hook. So then, and tonight, I'll try to make my a little talks a little bit more shorter, you know, and uh, I can just, and by the border speaks a little bit before I do, and I come in, I'll try to make my speeches or little talks just juvenile to your brethren. And if you would think at that, because anything I could say would probably be juvenile to you, but you are teachers and I'm not a teacher. And I, my purpose is to try to help the kingdom of God, try to strengthen your churches and strengthen brotherhood among men as you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And I'm sure you'll understand that. And now this here Los Angeles, as I've noticed this morning, and met my some of my friends here, Brother Southman there, from Jeffersonville, originally a Canadian, and Brother Tom is also a Canadian. That's her journey with us in Jeffersonville at this time, and Brother Welch Evans there from Tifton, Georgia, also a soldier with us driving 1,500 miles every Sunday, 2 and 4, hear me preach the gospel now. And there is Brother Norman from, and Sister Norman, and Sister Evans, and Brother Willie, I can't never think the little group setting in the little huddle there that's come out here with us and to pray with us and to strengthen as we go in for the service. Glad to have them with us in the meetings. Now, in setting this meeting, I looked and we had a book of meetings, just people, and the difficult that we're having now between the denominational brethren and many of them, they, the denominational brethren, as you all are yet, I'd like to, over this pulpit this morning, express my view, see, there, you know, yourselves, brethren, among your people, you can say something this way, and one will take it this way, and start leaning it this way, and you'll tie it to the next one, the next one to the next one, and the first thing you know, it's all together of Keter, and one will lean it this way, and take it the other way, you know that? And I'm sure that you brethren understand that that's the way a lot of things are said about me and it's just taken by some and misunderstood and just led off. It's not the meaning at all. As far as being against a denomination, certainly not. My brethren are there. It's just like there's too many people today depending on the denomination. Now, we've got a brother sitting here from the United Brethren Church and different places. It's them denominations are right as long as stretch a corridor a little bit further over. 
can open up the gate and drink at the third well. You know what I mean? That Jacob dug and can have a fellowship. But when you come, just as long as you belong to the domination, that's all you have to do. No, there's a lot more than that to it, brother. And that's where the whole world has always, and you, we have sitting here with us this morning, a fine historian. And we know that churches, as soon as they draw a, that line, denomination, we are it. Right there, God leaves them. And they die and never live again, see? There's no history of whenever a church ever fell and ever rose again. It doesn't. And because when I first came into this, in this ministry, it was you, brethren of the United Pentecostal Church, that opened your arms first for me. That was Brother Richard Reed, Brother Jack Moore, and Brother Ben Pemberton, that at St. Louis at my first meeting. And the first meeting I ever attended to was and know anything about the was a PA of W and PA of JC and there was before they merged and come together Brother Royal at Mishawaka and I never seen such a fine fellowship of brethren. Well then I found out I thought that's all Pentecost was that that was Pentecost but I found out there were different groups all around everywhere and there were fine men in each one of them so I tried to stand in the bridge without my arms out trying to call every brother to a unity of fellowship so that we can have an understanding no matter what they believe as long as we are brethren because i'm sure if i had to put myself there's a lot of flaws that god could point his finger in my face this morning and say young man you are a long ways from being a perfect yourself so that's the way i've tried to feel about everybody to draw them together now that's my purpose you have a union fellowship god ever bless you and in that as i started to say a few months ago in the midst of all of this, yet, there was hundreds of places that's calling, and for the mission fields, and now I've got an evangelistic trip. I'm crossing the country, and just soon as I leave that, I'm going into the foreign countries on a missionary trip. And I'm trying in myself that I haven't got time to explain seeking something from God, because I believe that the approach coming of Christ is closer than me, I think, you know, I believe it's right at the door and it really makes me nervous when I think of it. Not nervous for myself, but nervous of this. Have I done my very best? Is there one more ounce in me that I can, could have given for the kingdom of God? Is there something I could have done? Because this is the only opportunity we're ever going to have right now. And I have scolded the church, I've scolded our people, I've scolded our sisters for cutting their hair, scolded them for wearing makeup, I've scolded our brothers for permitting them to do it, and our ministers and things like that. Not because that I have anything against them, it's because I'm jealous of them, they are God's heritage. And I've scolded my minister brothers for not, for just drawing themselves into one little thing in a group. Now, I'd think if there was a denomination that would say, we believe this comma plus all that God can add to it. But when we make our denominational realm, we say we believe this period. And the Holy Spirit moves right in and moves right out of it. That's right, see? Now, if you can enter to the comma, then we can just keep on growing. Recently, I had a meeting with the Lutheran Brethren. I guess you all heard of it at Minneapolis, Minnesota. And oh my, did he ever wreck me? over the coals in a 22-page letter. He said, the very idea, said, I drove 15 miles last night through a blinding snowstorm. I thought I would hear a servant of Christ. And what did I hear? A polished-up soothsayer. And oh, he, and said, the very idea of you, a man with 15 years in the mission fields and saved been preaching the gospel for 25 years and said, then here, to hear you use the grammar that you use and the very doctrine that you speak. He said, you even said so much last night that Satan could not heal. Said, shame on you for such a remark. And I thought, a dean of Lutheran College? And he said, right, not far from a college here, there's a woman with a familiar spirit. She puts a big apron on and the people comes in and she puts her arms, hands on them, and then she plucks their veins and gets her hair in the back of their, her neck and roll it up, get the blood on there and walk down to a creek behind her and throws it over her head like that into the creek, starts walking out with her hands and said the people standing up there, if she's constrained to look back, the disease is on the blood of the person in their hair and said then when look back, the disease will come 
back to the person but if not said the person is to get well and said about 25 of those get well and then you say the devil can't heal oh he had a good mental approach but brother that's not what we approach not mental we approach the scripture so just thought well 22 page letter didn't even address me as brother just said Branham so I thought well he said are you talking about your ears he said I was preaching the gospel for he was born well I thought a man that's been preaching the gospel that long should have respect no matter what he is see we should respect him and so I sat down and I trust him metal scratching the best I could two pages back to recognize him and I said brother dear I should appreciate the many years that you have spent and all of this I said I appreciate it as servant of Christ and I do appreciate the criticism now a man that can't take criticism there's something wrong with his experience you see because God sends criticism to us to correct us to make us see our bad points I've been helped so much by criticism that's friendly criticism just not get nasty and angry but just friendly criticism so I said I appreciate it sir and then I said but just one thing I'd like to express here as you speak in my grammar of course I'm not I have an education that's true but I said the thing what surprises me that a dean of a Lutheran college would base his theology upon an experience in the stead of the word of God when you talked about the witch that could heal I said Jesus said if Satan can cast out Satan then his kingdom is divided he cannot heal now you can see if he can Jesus said he couldn't heal and you said he could heal I'm going to believe Jesus see that's right because he said let every man's word be wrong and he's be right and I said I believe Jesus and surprising to me that a dean of Lutheran College would base his theology upon an experience or an emotion instead of that of God. I said a dean or anyone else, any minister, should base his theology upon that of the Lord. And I said, I'm certainly, and what you call to be a soothsayer, I said, I presume that it was a discernment. And I said, did you know that the Pharisees and Sadducees once made that remark themselves? When they seen the same thing done by our Lord, called him Bezabab, I said, now perhaps, what if I am right? Now Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost has come to do the same, that to speak a word against it would never be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. No matter about your 50 years of being preaching a word against the Holy Spirit, I said, I forgive you for that. And I know that God will, for he's seen that you didn't understand it. And I wrote him the nicest letter that I could. Later, I got a letter inviting me to come up. So by my coughs, I had a pardon me. I had a businessman breakfast up there and was speaking for the full gospel businessman. And Mr. Moore, Brother Jack Moore, many of you brethren are acquainted with him, one fine man. And I, he, this Dr. Hegre, came to Brother Moore and asked him if I could, if he'd bring me over to the college. I thought I'm sure in for it now. And so I, Brother Moore, is a theologian. So I thought, well, I better take him along. And so I said, you said right next to me. And if he speaks some words and grammar that I don't understand, I'll kick you in the leg like that. And you take from their own. And he said, all right. So he went over to the college. And when he got there, there are a place about the size of this auditorium here, the dinner. And it was Norwegian people. And they had the dinner set. And very fine, nice. And the dean sat next on one side and his associate the other one. So after I finished, he said, Brother Branham, we want to ask you some questions. I said, let me kind of first have a word. I said, I may not be able to answer a question. I said, if I can't, it will be all right, Brother Moore, to help me here. I said, but I've, I may not be good at answering questions, but I'll do what I can. And he said, here's what it is. He said, we have heard of Pentecostals ears and ears and said, we went to see them and said, what did we find? But kicking over the chairs, knocking out the windows and everything like that. He said, and all that noise we ever heard in our life. He said, what's those people got? I said, the Holy Ghost. He said, the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. I said, he said, have you always been a Pentecostal? I said, well, I once belonged to a missionary Baptist church 
where I was just a boy, was ordained. But I said immediately after I got ordained, I said I got the Holy Ghost, so I guess I've been Pentecostal. He said, you mean to tell me that's Pentecostal, then people, then Pentecostal people, that's the Holy Ghost making them kick over their chairs and carry on like that? I said, yes, it is the Holy Ghost. I said, the thing of it is, I said, they got so much pressure built up, steam. They blew it out, the whistle, instead of putting it in the engine. <clears throat> Make the wheels roll, see? That's all. I said, I said, that's right. I said, they, so much steam there, they just have to put it out, the whistle. That's all I know, you see? And I said, they can't hold it no longer. And he said, well, I said, if I could get fundamental teaching in Pentecostal faith or Pentecostal faith in fundamental teaching, then people are servants of God, but they really don't realize the position that they hold, that's all. And he said, well, what do you think we Lutheran has got? I said, the Holy Ghost. Then he stopped. And he said, now, I don't know what to ask you. I said, well, I understand that you got about a thousand acres here that you put in corn. I said, if the students are able to pay their way through, then they can work their way through the college. He said, right. So the Lord gave me a little thought. And I said, sir, one time there's a man who broke up a great field to plant corn. And he planted his corn in the field. And the next one morning, he went out. And when he looked out upon the field, he saw two little blades. Anyone knows that's raised corn, that's how it comes up. When we call the spring corn down in the south, it just comes up like that, two little blades. And I said, the man stood on his doorstep and said, praise the Lord for my good crop of corn. I said, now, did he have a crop of corn? He said, well, he had a start. And I said, well, potentially, he had a crop of corn, see. He had it in its infant form. And I said, that was a Lutheran's. And I said, finally, the corn grew up to a place he had a tassel. And you know what the tassel did? The tassel looked back down at the blades and said, I have no more use for you anymore. I'm a tassel. But it had to use a blade again in order to reproduce itself. Then it brings forth from this tassel back into the blade and it brought forth a ear. I said, now the first was Eulothran, the second was the Methodist move of God, and the third, the ear, was the Pentecostal group that brought back a restoration of the gift to the church, of the original grain that went into the ground, is just restoring again. As Joel said, see, I said, now I know we've got a lot of fungus on that ear, but we've got some grains there too, you know. I said, we, and I said, and he said, well, I said, that is the original grain. I said, now, the Pentecostal church is the advanced Lutheran church. After all, if there had been no leaf, there would have been no tassel. And the life that was in the leaf made the tassel, and the life that was in the tassel made the grains. So it's an advanced church of the living God. And he stopped, pushed back his plate. He said, Brother Branham, I went west one time that he, I wrote, I had a book wrote about all the spiritual gifts and said I went west to find the man and said when I did he said oh I just wrote about them and I didn't have them said I just wrote about them well said I could have done that and said I went around and I noticed all this and I went to the Pentecostal groups and so forth and said I noticed them shouting you see I just happened to be there the devil put him there at the wrong time. You know, when the people were really rejoicing, so he's got an opinion and went out, see? And he said, I apologize for the letter that I wrote you. He said, I built myself up such a place that I was against it. And that's why I pinned it down right there and said, you was not nothing but a soothsayer. He said, I ask you to forgive me. I said, why since? Certainly, sir. I never hold nothing. I never did that, you know what I told you in the letter. He said, I wanted to hear it from your lips. He said, now, Brother Branham, tell me and all the students who are all hungering for the Holy Ghost, what must we do? So you know what I told him, don't you? I said, turn your backs, your backs this way and your faces to the wall all the way around and make a purpose in your heart that you'll never leave your knees until God gives you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I said, now, don't think about this or that or the other. Just stay there and say, God, I want the Holy Ghost. 
I went around and laid hands on them, and forty received the Holy Ghost right then. And now there are about five hundred of them strong, going, having signs, miracles, and honors, and so forth. See, brethren, I believe that you have the thing that the world must have, but we've got to approach it in a way. What if you are a carpenter? Just take the man on the end there, over the borders, over there is a carpenter, I believe. Well, what if he was driving a hammer like this and driving nails and I had an automatic hammer of some sort that could pour a keg of nails into it and hold it up like this and a root and drive them all boards up like that a whole lot better than I could with this hammer. Now, if I could walk up to him and say, oh boy, you're not even in it. You know nothing about it, why? You're mashing your fingers, my... You just haven't got a product to begin with. I'm offending him. I'll never sell the hammer. That's right. See, it's my approach with what I have, my product. I know is better than what he's got. But I've got to remember, i got to approach him in the right way. And if I walk up to him and say, how do you do, sir? My name is Branham. Mine is Borders. I see you're a carpenter. Yes, sir, I am. I really believe you're a carpenter too, yes? I was watching the way he was handling your hammer. Oh yes, old Betsy has been with me a long time. I said, yeah, that's a good one, yeah? Sure, good, too. And uh, you can really handle it, yeah? Go ahead, talk to him a while. I said, it, did you ever hear of such and such a hammer? No, I don't believe I did. Well, here it is. You put nails in here and let's just tuck those boards up down there. Look at the time this does and what a product I got. Show it to him like that. See? Take it and try it for a few days and see what you think about it. I'll be back. See, if it's the right kind of a product, it'll sell itself. You know what I mean? Don't you, brethren? See, see, we got the right thing. We got to approach the people with it right. See, that's the thing. See, it is a real genuine thing. This is the Holy Spirit. I believe it with all my heart. I don't believe that brethren are renegades. I believe they are brethren. I do not believe that the Spirit that does the discernment is in his source there. I believe it is the Holy Spirit revealing himself in his church, just making his church, the church to come to his place. And if we could just have some way that we could take the whole Pentecostal move and just break down natural barriers and a place to come together and set in heaven places in Christ Jesus to which we are baptized in by one spirit, oh, I think that would be the manifestations that had never been known before. And if we could approach the Methodist, the Baptist, the Pentecostals could go everywhere to every place, I believe it could be done. Brethren, I don't want to stand here. I want to read just a word or two from this Bible and talk to you just a moment. But I wanted, I know you got to go, and I have to, and I got that breakfast the Saturday morning, and then just anticipating to stay for Monday night too, another one down here. I don't know just yet. I have to talk to the borders and so forth. But I want to leave this with you, that I'm here to help you. It's just we don't have a just to sit together a few minutes. I wish we could just stay here until the service started this afternoon. And then in the morning, come back again and I listen to what you brethren had to say and how I appreciate it. But I just to let you know my heart, I appreciate you. And I'm going to do all that I can to help you as my brothers too with what little ministry the Lord has given me and what he has given you that we are putting it together now to see what we can do for the, his kingdom. Let us bow our heads just a moment before we approach his word. Most gracious God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to thee with humble, contrite spirits broken up. Lord, knowing that we are already for the molding, as the prophet went down to the potter's house to be molded, and Father, we desire this morning in our hearts that you will break us so that we will be molded into different characters, characters that will represent Jesus Christ. Take my foolish heart, Lord. Take my stammering words and break them to pieces. Lord, break my own self-will out and make a new person in Christ. Grant it, Lord. That's the desire of our hearts. That's why we're here. And Lord, while we're speaking to you over this altar, where this little Jewish brother who believes in you, Brother Michaelson, I pray for him. Father, I pray that you will bless him. And we're thankful for the opportunity to be here in this Christian synagogue. Bless us together now as we just wait a few moments 
on reading the word bless it to our thoughts bless our services lord god you know our heart and i just want to be knitted with one heart and one soul in one purpose that is with my brethren here that here in this dark dismal land of this 20th century down here in 1962 near the turn of the century again the time is up and over here on the west coast where civilization has traveled from the east to west and we realize that it can't go no further now we go back east again when we leave this coast and as civilization has come, we realize the sun travels east to west. And there was a time when the SON came upon the Eastern people and it showed great light and signs that he was the Messiah. And he promised the prophet, said, there'd be a day that could not be called day nor night. We'd had this dismal foggy day of 2000 years almost of just being able to believe enough light to get around by. And knowing that he was the son of God, and build us a church and an organization and try to hold brothers and sisters together and call them to live right. But Lord, the fog is clearing away. There's coming a light on the Western people. The same S-O-N with the same signs, the same gospel, our restoration, you promised in the last days that there would come forth a message that would restore the faith of the children back to the fathers. Oh God, let us return to that original day of Pentecost. Let us come back to that great faith that was once delivered to the saints. May the great bright tree of God that the palm worms has eaten down bring forth in its top of it the fruit that the evening lights will ripen for the coming of the Son of God. Grant it, Lord, help us as we pull together for this purpose. We commit ourselves to you. We are yours. Do with us, Lord, as you see fit. We commit ourselves this morning in the synagogue into your hands, Lord. May a great purpose be achieved in our lives as we give ourselves wholly to you. Not a Samson. Samson gave his strength, but he never gave his heart. God, may our heart, our strength, our all, our all be given to you. Make it mighty, Lord. Multiply it for the kingdom of God's sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 16th Psalm, just for way of reading the last verse, Thou will show me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand there is pleasure forevermore. And now, ever, you know, I wouldn't try to preach. I'd just like to talk to you a minute or say, for instance, about 15, 20 minutes, David was speaking of life. Thou will show me the path of life. Did you notice it? Will you show me or could you show me? I hope you show me. Thou will show me. I believe that everyone that God has called will hear and will come. I believe that's what we are facing now in our meeting. We can only sow the seed. Some will fall by the wayside. Some will fall one way and some will fall another. But some will fall on the good ground. That is right. Show me the path of life. Now, life is the greatest thing that we could achieve. There's nothing no greater than life. If I could go to glory this morning and we could all go up there and I could meet Abraham, what's the greatest thing? There is Abraham. He'd say life. There's no matter what anything else is, life is the greatest thing that anyone can achieve is life. What would you give for life? I've got a book at home and it was, I believe, it was written by Brother Nugent a chaplain for the prisons, and he gives the testimonies in this book of the great people that died on earth and from the time of Christ down, and he gives the testimony of the wicked great and the testimony of the spiritual great on the other side of the book. And I believe I was reading there, I believe it was Blood E. Mary of England, where she said, I could give all, I'd give my kingdom for five minutes more life. The kingdom that she had put so many to death because, and so forth, and yet, she would give that kingdom for five more minutes of life. I still remember the testimony of Paul Reader right out here. When he died there in the tabernacle, or where, at the tabernacle where he said, when he was dying, he called Luke his brother. They kind of chummed together, like Billy Paul, my son and I, and I understood it from the Moody School, that there was a quartet in there singing, and Paul had a sense of humor. They was singing, Nyara, my God, to thee. And he said, See who's dying here, me or you. And said, Raise up them shades and sing me some snappy gospel songs. And started singing, Down at the cross, 
something like that, the quartet. And he said, where is Luke? He was in the next room. They brought him in. He took a hold of Luke's hand and he said, Luke, think of it in five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Let me go like that. Great Moody, you know what his testimony was when he raised up? He said, this is death. said, this is my coronation day. And that's the way I like to go. I held the hand of my precious mother just recently going. I held the hand of my wife. When she went, I watched them. When they come to the end of their road, life is the greatest thing there is. And those who have no hope after this is over, it's a terrible thing. We walk down the path of life. So many people say, where is life? Where can I find it? Why? It's just all around us. God has made it so much. Even like in Job, we find out in Job, he asks about it. All the way down through life, we hear it, asking about it. it. Reminds me of a little boy that lived down in Jeffersonville, where I live. One day, they said he was, went to his mother, and he said, Mother, God, this God that you talk about, he's such a great person. Could anybody see him? She said, as a pastor. So I went to the pastor and asked him. He said, oh no, Sunday school teacher. And the Sunday school teacher said, you better ask the pastor. She didn't know. So I went to the pastor. He said, no, no, son. He said, no man can see God and live. He said, you don't see God well. He kind of disappointed the little fellow. And there was an old fisherman. And as he was up on the river one day, with his old fisherman fishing, and there come up a storm, as many of you, I guess, are from the east and know how there are washes of the leaves you know, coming down the river. And the little boy was sitting in the back of the boat and the sun was setting to the west and a rainbow come across the river like that. And the old fisherman oaring the waters had quietened in the foam from the storm and everything was fresh and the smell of the blossom and he piled over his grey beard, big silver tears begin to flow down his beard as he looked and the little boy was around to see what he was looking at he looked at the old fisherman he ran up from the stern of the boat out to the center of the boat and he sat down by the old fisherman's knees and he said sir i want to ask you something my mother is not able to answer me my Sunday school teacher you know my pastor said is god being so great could any man see him and the old fisherman pulled the oars into his lap Put the little boy's head over against his shoulder, said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've ever seen for the past 40 years has been God, see? He was just, you have to have God in here to see him out there, see? God was on the inside looking through your eyes. I'm looking across the street to see a tree. I'm thinking now, when I come through the Majavi Desert, or the desert coming down here, Everything seemed to be so dead. And just as I got there, close to the Colorado River, there's one little green bush. It was uh, so conspicuous, I thought, where it's uh, getting its life from. See, it had life. It was living. God is in life. He is everything that is alive has God in it. Job said one day, if a tree dies, it will live again. But man lieth down, he giveth up the ghost. And where is he? His sons come to mourn and pay him honor, but he perceive it not. Oh, that thou wilt hide me in the grave and keep me in the secret place till my right be passed. What? And he seen, he noticed God in his nature, life. How a little flower comes up. It stands there after it's pretty and there's some young ones in the bed or the flowers and some little aged and some old ones but when the frost comes and strikes them it kills them all and the little flower drops little petals off and out of that flower bud there's a little black seed little teeny fellow falls out and as strange as it seems but yet god has a funeral procession for that flower did you know that the rain fall rain comes and it cries great big tears down of water and he buries that little seed down in the ground. Along comes the winter freeze and freeze it, burst the pulp runs out of it. Every natural thing that you could look at is gone. A scientist could take a handful of that dirt and take it down to the laboratory and examine it back and forth and you cannot find that germ of life. It's not there. 
the potash, the calcium, and the petroleum, and moisture, everything that's in it has returned back into the dust. But somewhere hid in there is a term of life. And just as sure as the sun rises again in the springtime, it will live again. God has provided a way for it. You take and put concrete down through your yard in the winter time. Lay stones. Why is the greatest grass bed? Is right around the edge of your walk. Why? It's those seeds that was covered up. And when the sad sun begins to shine upon that botany life, that little seed of life will wend its way around all that concrete, over every rock, right down under every stick, and come around till it sticks its little head up outside and praises the God of life. You just can't hide life. And that's what we're here for, brethren, to bring life. Not long ago, I was sitting, eating dinner with an old Methodist minister, a gracious old saint of God. He had the Holy Spirit in his life, and we were listening to the agricultural hour coming from Louisville, and the forage club had had a machine that they could perfect a grain of corn so perfect that it would make just a corn as good a cornbread as the one that comes grown out on the field. The same kind of conflicts. And actually, we could cut them open, put them in a laboratory, and its heart was in the right place, the right amount of moisture and potash and all that's in the corn. You could not separate them. One, mix them together. You could not tell one from the other. It was so perfect. He said the only way that you can tell which is which is bury them. The one the machine made rots, and that's all of it. But the one that God grew, it's got a life in there that will raise up again. A man might look like a Christian, impersonate a Christian, or walk like a Christian, or so forth. But unless a germ of life is in there, he cannot rise again. Jesus said, I come that you may have life, Zoe, God's own life in them. And there's everything that had a beginning as an end. It's those things which had not a beginning has no end. There is only one thing that never had a beginning, that was God. And we become his children, part of him. Then Zoe, God's own life, eternal life, is imparted to us. And that's the only way that we can live. And that's the only way that our lost friends out here even church members can ever live again is because Zoe has been imparted to them and we become a part. Did you notice on the day of Pentecost how that this great pillar of fire, which we all know was a messenger of the covenant, which was Jesus Christ, that Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he forsook Egypt following that great messenger of his light. On the day of Pentecost, when this great light came in there, God divided himself, tongues of fire set upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak in other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. God separating himself from one being to being in his church, dividing his life with his people. And that's the message we must get to the people. They'll perish without it. They have to. My own mother just passed away recently when I stood by her side and she said, Billy, all of our children was uh, her children were standing there. What was living two of us was gone out of ten. And the girl, she looked at me and she said, first, she looked at Dolores. She said, my last and my first. A mother was a gracious Christian and had led her to Christ and baptized her so many years ago. And she said, Dolores, you've been good to me. You've helped me. You've done a mania washing for me when I got an old and can't wash. You've come down to clean up my house and you've done these things. She said, I love you, honey. And Dolores, a young Christian, standing there choking, looking down, and she said, Mother, it was so little. She said, Billy, you see that I didn't go hungry. And I said, Mama, how many times have you walked away from the table so I could have something to eat when we were and had nothing to eat? And I said, it was just my duty, Mother. And she said, then you kind of been a spiritual guide to me, Billy. You baptized me. You told me the way of life. I said, Mama, you know, Catholic is a, a background is Catholic. And I said, I went to the church and they said, this is a church. And it was contrary to the word. I went from church to church 
and I found out it was so contrary. So I stayed with the word mother, and I said, I've tried to tell you what was right and lead you to Christ. And the dear old saint went away to meet God, and then I committed her soul back to God. Dolores called me, and she said, Billy, I just can't get over it. She said, Mother, I said, Dolores, look out across the road from where you live. Isn't there a large oak tree standing there? She said, yes. This was just a few days before Mother died. And she said, yes. I said, it's all, it's coming for now. I said, about a month ago, those leaves were real pretty and green. Yes. She said, Bill, I said, when was, what does it look like now? And she said, well, they are yellow and brown and green red. And I said, Dolores, what makes them turn yellow, brown, green, and red? She said, they are dying. I said, now, when was a tree the prettiest? She said, now. I said, the Bible said, precious. In the sight of the Lord, the death of his saints, see, that's when the time comes. I said, the life is going back. Life is a tree. We're all hanging on the tree of life. That is right, Mr. Wood, who is a book salesman in the meeting. He was a Jehovah Witness. And he was, had a boy that with him also, his leg drawed up like this with polio. And he had been in Louisville in one of the meetings and noticed that discernment. And he said, now that seems right to me. And so he went to Eastern Texas when I was there with a the kid's son in them. And the, when the picture of the angel of the Lord was taken and well, it's been taken several times. And just recently, all of it taken again, it was taken in Germany so many times. So, and Brother Wood, had brought his boy and was up at one of the meetings and they were setting way back oh almost a half a city block or farther away one night standing on the platform never heard of him in my life just standing there looking around i noticed a vision in front of me and i said there's one man he's sitting way back in the back him and his wife and they are from the state of Kentucky, way down to a place called Lagrange, Kentucky. His name is Wood. He's a carpenter. He's got a boy that has a polio damage that's pulled his leg up. Thus, say the Lord, the boy is healed. And just started on like that. And his wife was a Methodist. And so, I believe a church of God, Anderson, church of God. So, say, did you hear that, Ruby? And so, he said, David, stand up. His leg was perfect, just perfect as the other. He's in a meeting. And then that Jehovah Witness gave himself to Christ. And then from that come his brother down oh they you know how they the Jehovah Witness feel. They come down to turn his brother out from the fellowship. He said, You listen to such a thing as that? I said these false things going around like that. You've been his father's a reader in the Jehovah Witness. He said, You know better than such a thing as that. He said, If I ever see that man, I'll give him a piece of my mind. He said, I know teaching my daddy has given me. He said, That's him mowing grass out there. And I come in with an old flop down hat, you know, and sat down, talked to him. He said, Well, he said, I'll tell you, Mr. Branham. He said, We were raised Jehovah Witness. I said, that's very fine. I said, I'd rather be a Russellite than no light at all. And just went on like that, not disregarding anything that he had said and talked to him the best that I could. And I said, I see that you're a married man and you have two children. And he, I said, but is separated from your wife. And he looked over to Banks. That's Mr. David Wood, father, the one that's in the meeting. He looked over, he thought, Maybe Mr. Wood had told me that, and I caught his thought right quick, you see. And so I said, you thought that Brother Banks had told me that? He did not. He told me nothing about his family, but I said, maybe you think if Banks told me this night before last, he was with an urban-haired woman, you were in the room with her when her lover came up to the door and knocked at the door, and she went to the door and wouldn't let you come. And you looked through the window. It was a good thing. You would have shot your brains out. I said, the man standing there with the dark suit on, a red tie. Oh, he liked to fall over the floor. That he said, that's the truth. That's the truth. And they baptized him a few days later from that. Here come his daddy down. Here come his sister down. She was going to come down the street and put the boys out, baptize the the same day she come, by the same thing. And down come his daddy. 
he was going to straighten us all of us out. So he wanted to take us. I said, he was a fisherman. I said, now, Banks, let's take him fishing. So we started across the river. It went all night, you know, how it is in the east. The rivers get up and things. He was going down to the Wolf Creek Dam, and on the road over, he never said nothing about religion yet. Very stern old man. And he said, and smart as he could be, so we crossed the river. I said, well, I saw a vision come before me there as I was sitting. Banks was driving. I watched the vision. I said, now every stream we cross, he had just said that night, he said, if I could ever see anything like that happen, I would believe it. And so that morning, the Lord's grace, I said, we are, every stream we cross will be muddy. When we get to the Wolf Creek Dam, the rains went above the dam and there, or below the dam rather, and it won't be muddy, and we'll fish today. We'll catch nothing today until evening, and then Mr. Woods here, Bank Wood, we're going to catch one small catfish. I'm going to catch about 20 pounds, and some of them will weigh as much as 10 pounds apiece. You'll fish with some bait in the same place. You won't catch anything. We'll fish about 11 o'clock at night, and the fish will quit biting and will go in and eat our supper at 11 o'clock that night, stay all night, and the next morning we'll go out and I'm going to catch a large fish that has kills on him, and that will be the last thing that's caught. We won't. We will fish us at the day and catch nothing. And the old man looked around kind of like that. We went down, and everything happened just perfectly to the dot, the way it did. And when I come out on the planks that evening, he said, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And there's the whole group of them. Oh, it's a glorious thing to know that we're hanging on the tree. Now, there was Mr. Wood, and I was squirrel hunting. And you know, I am I like to hunt. And so we were squirrel hunting together down in Kentucky about two years ago now. I come in on my vacation that fall, and I've hunted in Africa, India, and all over the world nearly, but I... Just give me a foggy morning in August or sometime with that point two two rifle. And so then I just love to squirrel hunt, to hunt squirrel. And we were down in Kentucky on a two-week stay, and it got real hot. Now, you Californian may not know what I'm speaking about when the leaves and everything is so hot. And, uh, and you step on there, and them little gray squirrels, and uh, we only shoot the eye only at 50 yards. If he's 40 yards, we'll back off to the 50 yards and shoot at the eye. If they don't, it strikes below the eye, above his eye, go change the rifle, there's something wrong. And so we stay right with it. That's the way I've tried to train myself to that, to shoot it exactly to the spot. And so then, well, up there camping, and it got so awful hot. And the little gray squirrels, you talk about Houdini at being an escape artist. He's a minor at one of them. Just strike a little brush, he's gone. You all know brother J.H. Brown. Just ask him about it one time. We hunted together. And so then, and I tease him about that old automatic shotgun his wife bought him. You know, about 20 years ago. So shooting squirrels, the shotgun. So then we were hunting. And there was a brother Wood said, you know, brother Branham. He said, over here at a certain place, there's some hollows. I don't think you have them in California. It's down, down, way down where the creeks run down through and messy dump, you know, up on that flat grounds. You touch that brush and they are gone. You can't get on them for they go two or three hundred yards away. They are gone that quick. But Branham snaps his fingers. So then we said, we'll go over there and see if he will let us hunt. Said he has about 500 acres. And I said, well, that's will be fine. And so we went down, not nice roads like you have here, but through hog paths and everything else, through brush over hollows, till we got in there, he said, now, there's just one defect about this. Said, this old man said he's an infidel and oh, he's rough. I said, oh, I'll just let you do the talking, see? So I set the little trunk and we drove up to the white, nice white house way back down at the foot of the big hill and a big weed field and a corn patch on this side. We drove up, there's an old, two old men setting up there, very Kentucky, 
the Kentucky has its own way of living, you know. Brother David Buck, the Greek brother, said, Brother Branham, listening at your tips, said, this is kind of awful to see this after breakfast. He said, you mentioned a hair in the biscuit. He said, I've looked up. I can't find what that is. And I said, that's just Kentucky, you see. I hear in a biscuit. I said, don't try to find it in a dictionary because it won't be there. I said, in Kentucky. So we got back then in the Thassafras Hollow, you know, and the big old hats hanging down. We stopped, and the brother Wood got out, went around, was two old men sitting there. And he walked up to one of them, and he called him, said, how do you do? And he said, how do you do, sir? And he said, I am, my name is Wood, I'm Banks Wood. He said, I wonder, we have been hunting over here at Dutton, and they name their places by the creeks. Said, we've been hunting over at Dutton, and we wondered if we could hunt on your place. He said, what wood are you? He said, I'm Jim Wood's boy. He said, anything of them, that was one bunch of Jehovah's Witness that was genuine people. He said, anything that Jim Wood any of his people is welcome to anything I got on this place. He said, old man Jim, is he still living? He said, yes, he's out in Indiana now. And said, I'm living out there too, he said. And I come down squirrel hunting each fall. He said, help yourself, I got 500 acres and plenty of hollows and things, just help yourself. He said, well, thank you very much. He said, I brought my pastor along. He said, you wouldn't mind him hunting too. He said, Wood, you mean to tell me you've got so low down till you have to carry a preacher with you wherever you go? And he said, so I thought it was about time for me to get out of the car. So I get out of the car, you know, and walks over there. And I said, how do you do? He said, howdy. And he said, before you could introduce me, he butted right in. He said, well, he said, I ain't got much use for you guys. I said, I admire your honesty. And he said, the reason it is, is this one thing he said the first place you don't look like a preacher squirrel blood and whiskers and hadn't been had a bath for two weeks um so i said well i guess that's right too and he said the thing that i got against you fellows you're backing up around a tree that sh there's nothing in now i don't know whether you know what that is that's another kentucky david don't try to find a dictionary when a coon dog is a liar, he will run to a tree, and a coon has got a trick. He will run, jump up on a tree, and then jump off. You see? And if a dog ain't well trained, he will run to this tree where he seen the coon smelled, where he tracked around the tree and stand there and back, and there's nothing in the tree. So they usually shoot the dog. So he said, you guys, that's what you need. A good load of buckshot, he said, because you're backing up a tree that is nothing there. You know what I mean, preaching, he said. I'm considered an infidel. I said, well, every man to his own opinion, but to me, that's nothing to brag about. And he said, well, said, he said, the thing of it is, said, you're talking about something there that there isn't such a thing. I said, yes, sir. I said, of course, that's to opinion. And he said, well, he said, you guys talking about a God, there's no such a thing. And he said, if there was one, I could see him. And said, I've lived all these years, I'm 70 something years old, and said, I ain't seen nothing of him yet. And he said, there's just no such a thing. And you guys are backing up the wrong tree. And you're taking the people's money for your livelihood and things like that. And you're nothing but a bunch of cheaters. I thought, oh my, I said, yes, sir. of course, that's opinion. I thought, oh God, if you don't help me. So I said, yes, sir, that's of course opinion, I said. And you know, mama, my old southern mama always give me good advice. And she gave me expression one time, said, give a cow enough rope and she'll hang herself, you see. So I thought, that's a good one for him. Just let him go ahead and back a while and we'll see what tree is up, you see? So then I let him go ahead and talk, and I found something, and something came to my mind. And there was an apple tree there, there was setting under, and a long fall of the ear, the apples, it was about the last week in August.
and the apples is dropping off and the yellow jacket was eating them you know what the yellow jacket is all right well what part of kentucky are you from see and so then i said to him i said you mind if i have one of the apples he said help yourself the yellow jackets are eating them i reached over and got it and rubbed it in the old bloody pants you know and bit off i said my it's a good apple I said yeah it's a dandy i said looks like she bears pretty heavy yes sir I said i got so many bushels every year for it how old is a tree changing the subject on him you know and he said oh he said you see where that old chimney stands up yonder I said i was born up there I said puppy mom and puppy lived there and said and fire burnt it down we built this new home down here and said then i was raised up here and said when puppy and mommy died i just stayed with the home and said and when we moved down here i put that tree in there 40 50 years ago or something and said it has been there ever since i said that's good i said my that's wonderful he said yes sir he said back to being a preacher he said i want to ask you something i said yes sir what is it he said you guys if you could produce anything why it would be different he said no i heard a preacher one time or heard of him said oh sister somebody up here on the hill said she was dying with cancer and said there was a preacher come over here to acton kentucky right it was about 30 miles from there and i would looked over at me and i shook my head he said over at the methodist campground he said this preacher was from out in indiana and he said and he come over there and said they said it was about 75 2500 people gathered out there that night and that's way back in the hills you know they come on horseback and everything to get there and said he was there for three nights and said on the second night said this old lady sister lives up at a place called campansville and while this preacher was preaching he looked back in the audience way back there where this woman was and called her name and said tonight before you go home you looked into a dresser drawer on the left hand side you picked up a little handkerchief with a blue figure on the corner of it you got it in your pocketbook and you've got a sister by the name of so-and-so and that's dying of cancer of the stomach go take the handkerchief and lay it on the woman and she'll be made well well said about midnight that night we thought they had a salvation army up there on the top of the hill he said i never heard such a roar in my life and they were screaming and if any of you know that was brother ben and them and up there putting that handkerchief on the woman and said we thought maybe the old lady died and the next morning said we went up there to see when they make arrangements for the funeral and she was setting there at the table high and her husband eating fried apple pies and drinking coffee you know what a fried apple pie is a half moon turnover i'm sure i'm at home so then you know I like that with molasses on sing i don't like to sprinkle i baptize you know and i just really pour it on them i like plenty of molasses on my pie so i just love them things and so then she was eating this fried apple pie and said the day before there she was in a big fix so it's such a fix till we couldn't even they couldn't no more put her on a bedpan that they had just used a draw sheet and said me and my wife went up there and changed her bed twice a day and said the doctor gave her up about six weeks before that and just give her enough pen or batch or toll to last her until she was gone the cancer they opened her up and just covered her over so said there's no need of fooling with her anymore and said and you know she was sitting there eating and jumped up and ran and shook hands with us and i said i said you don't say so I said yeah I said now and said if you don't believe it I said you go right up there and see she'll tell you herself see he was preaching back to me then let him testify a while i said oh you don't believe that do you he said sure I said if you don't believe it you go right you go right up there on the hill and find out I'll take you up there. 
I said Aham said no. I said I'll take your word for it, seeing. I said I'll take your word for it. I said see who's that guy? I don't know, said he's from out in Indiana. And they said he's going to come down here again and said I'm going to him when he comes. Said I'm going to walk up to him and say, I want to tell you something, preacher. Tell me how in the world that you knew that. When you was never in this country before, I hadn't been see, said, How was you ever know that? I said, Yes, sir. Well, I said, Hope you meet him. I said, I hope he helps you. And he said, Well, I'm going. He was chewing tobacco, you know, and he spit down like that, and the leaves flew. And I said, And you mean to tell me now back to this tree? I said, I'm amazed at that. And I said, You know, we haven't even had a cool night, no frost or nothing. And I said, Those leaves are dropping off of that tree on the ground. And that's why we come over here was out of them flat woods where the leaves was dropping down, drying. And to get in these hollows here where they fall in the water and get wet, I said, and you, what in the world is them leaves dropping off on that tree for? Well, he said, the life left them. I said, the what? He said, the life left them. Left the leaf? Yeah, I said, that's what makes it drop off. I said, well, we haven't had any frost or any sign of any cold weather. He said, well, it's just leaves them. And I said, well, what happens to the life? He said, it goes down to the root of the tree. I said, what do you mean root? He said, well, the winter would freeze it and it would kill that time of life in the tree. And I said, then it goes down to the root of the tree to hide there until when? He said, till springtime. And it brings you up another mess of apples and a bunch of leaves. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. I said, that's strange. I said, I'd like to ask you something. He said, yes, sir. I said, what intelligence tells that tree that life in that tree, that winter time is coming, and if you don't get out of these limbs and get down here and covered with these roots, that you'll die. And that life obeys the intelligence and goes down in the root of the tree and stays down there until the winter time is past and then brings up a leaf again. I said, what intelligence does that, sir? And he said, oh, it's a nature. I said, what is nature? He said, well, he just actually does that. He seen my point, see, and was trying to hide from it. And he said, well, you, he said, you see? I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a bucket of water and set it out here on that oak post. And now, in the middle of August, it'll run down to the bottom of the post and stay there till springtime and come back and fill the bucket up again. Will you do that? He said, no, no. And I said, well, tell me what intelligence. It's got to be an intelligence now because a tree has no intelligence. It has to be an intelligence to make that life go from the tree up here in the branches down to the roots and an intelligence to tell it's time to come back up again. I said, I just hadn't thought of that. And I said, now, I think on that a long time. And when you find out what intelligence that told tells that sap in the tree that life to go down in the roots and hide or it will die, then I'll tell you the intelligence that told me who that woman was and what to do to save her life. He said, you know that preacher? I said, I am. There, show me. Thou will show me the path to life. Though it be so simple. And there on his knees, with his heart off, I led him to Christ. Show me the path of life to an ignorant farmer that probably couldn't write his own name, but God has a way to take a path of life to lead him to that. And brethren, we are hanging on the tree of life. And someday this old leaf is going to drop off, but there will come a resurrection someday, a great millennium lives ahead of us. A great resurrection will come back again someday because we have eternal life. We understand it from the way of our word. If we had time, you know how it is, we could approach it by so many ways. People, sometimes you have to use different methods to get it to a person. Last year, I went down 
I thought I'd go hunt on the old man's place. I drove up to the place and the weeds was all growed up all around it and I saw an elderly lady sitting on the porch pulling apples off the same tree. I walked up, I said, how do you do? She said, how do you do, sir? And I said, I'd seen big posted signs all around before I got in there. And I said, I wonder if it would be possible if I could hunt squirrel. She said, sir. When my husband was leaving, he was very odd. He posted the grounds and said, I have some boys from lives up in Kentucky or in Louisville, Kentucky, said, and they come down to hunt. I said, I understood that. He told me that, could I see him? She said, he's gone on. I said, you don't mean so, yeah? I said, well, he told me when he was leaving that I could hunt. She said, who are you? I said, I'm Brother Branham. She dropped her pan. She grabbed me by the hand. She said, Brother Branham, he's in glory now. She said, he lived a stunned Christian life from the hour. I said, and you are peeling apples from that same tree. I said, the apples come back again, didn't they? I said, so will he sometime in the great resurrection. And brother, sister, we can't afford to let people that we love and who Christ died for get away from this life to die without life eternal. Let's do everything we can to get them into that place where that they can rise again in the resurrection. Thou will show me the path of life. You, brethren, are able to do it, your congregations, because you are, many of you are studied ministers and theologians. I don't have that ability. But my little, I have no ability, but a little gift that was given me, I like to pull myself into a certain gear. That's where the people, or they're thinking, what they're doing, and what should be done. And a little min way of my ministry is just one of the little paths that God let me use to bring his children over to that side. And I'm joining mine with yours now. And let's show the people the path of life that they may find the way of the Lord. And he said here, for there is joy in the presence of the Lord. There is joy as we walk down this path, looking from side to side. The resurrection of the trees, the leaves, everything speaks of God. So let us be as God's creatures, speaking of God in everything that we do or say. Let it shine forth to his glory. God bless you. Let us bow our heads just a moment now. Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the flock. I'm so glad, Lord, that you showed me the path of life. And I'm so glad to be walking down this grand old highway. I'm so thankful to have my arms join with these brothers today as we're standing by the side of the highway screaming with our voices and all the talents that you have give us to that dying mass of humanity out there to which you died for. Lord, help us, will you please? May each one of our lives be a tree or something that will bring such conviction to the sinner and then believer that people, they might see the way of the Lord and enter into the joy of the Lord. Grant it, Father, bless us in our feeble efforts together. We thank you for this wonderful time of fellowship, for this grand breakfast. And Father, we feel that we have just our souls and our bodies are fed by the goodness of God. Be with us now as we go, Father to go into more meeting and be with us tonight and may something be done that will cause sinners to come quickly to the altar to be saved. May the sick be healed and those without the Holy Spirit may they get, be baptized into the body of Christ. Grant it, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We take our prayers, our faith, and we place them together, lay them upon your altar and send it to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, receive us. Amen. God bless you. You, my brethren, and I guess now one of the brethren will come for dismissing the church or the congregation formally as it should be. And while they're making up who is coming, I want to say I thank you for your fine attendance. And I'm sorry I've kept you here till at noontime, almost five minutes after 11 on my watch here. And I could just sit and talk to you about great things that I've seen happen, the Lord doing over in the mission fields and things of great, great thing. Don't never be afraid. Just remember God promised. God has got to keep his promise. He has just got to keep his promise. God bless you, brother Borders.